thank, thank you for staying. Uh, film festival in Sahara, well, we saw a little bit of it. It's a place where you go there and movies are the last important thing there to happen. It's just a, an excuse to create some awareness. And, uh, it happens every year in March, April, March. Unfortunately, it's every year. We always, at the end of the festival, toasting for to be the last one. Uh, because that will mean that the thing would have been fixed. Uh, and when you go there, well, you've heard about it many times. You just spend uh, five, six days with them and sit down and listen. And, and it was very, very uh, you know, encouraging. Of course, injustice and, and, uh, occurs there, as you see it happening, but also beautiful things happen. Uh, the, the strength, the patience, the peaceful uh, place where they are set in front of this uh, situation is something very encouraging. And of course, you come back home and, and you want to help. The Spanish society is really helpful to the Saharawis. For example, they are bringing their kids every summer to their homes, uh, volunteer, uh, some Spanish uh, citizens, to take those kids in summertime from those, from those camps because on shade it will be 50 degrees. So, and more than that. Uh, so, the awareness of this conflict in Spain is, is huge, it's big. But once you are there and you see it with your own eyes as everything in life, then you are shocked by it and you just ask yourself, what can you do? And we start doing things. And we write some signatures, as you saw in the movie. Apparently they were not enough for the president to take a look at it. And, uh, and we did different things. Until the moment where we're like, okay, what are we supposed to do? Movies, let's do a movie. <laughs> and thinking that in a couple of months we'll be made. And four years after, <laughs> we were looking at ourselves like, what, what, have, what have we done wrong? <laughs> and this is the journey that we did that we wanted to share with you. It's a journey of the movie. It's our journey. And in my figure, I guess, is the journey of anybody who's asking the question of what's going on, why this situation cannot be fixed, if it's so... Uh, easy to understand that should be these people should go back to their land and rights, human rights should not be violated. Well, we try to answer those questions for us but also for those who are interested in seeing it. And, and Alvaro, can you tell us a bit about how the collaboration began? You usually have worked as a producer in the past and here you've moved to a different position behind the camera. And we went together on this uh, trip that pretty much changed uh, everything for us, uh, for me especially. I had never directed before. And but as we started uh, going through the process, I, I, we, we decided we wanted to tell the story. We thought about doing a documentary and one day um, I, th I, I said to Javier, Javier, I think I know what we should, how it would look. No? Uh, but obviously I had never done it before. And, uh, if you support me, I will go. And he said, okay, let's go. And four years later, here we are. And, um, but I think that the, 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 the crucial thing was really being there and meeting them in person and seeing how, how they have hope. And they look at you with these eyes of hope because these people come from outside to their abandoned land where nobody's paying attention to them. But, and suddenly they come, these movie people come and show their films. And for them, it's like, this uh, glimmer of hope, and, and since we started doing the movie, every time that we have had a premiere, or uh, the film has been shown in a film festival, or even when it was released uh, uh, in Spain, which was a theatrical release, the, the Saharawis were so happy, you couldn't believe it. You know, it's, it's their, they have uh, somebody looking at them. The fact that all of you here are now part of, the, of this, you know, because uh, now you know. Thank you. It was very moving um, to see, you know, here you come to Toronto, you're staying in hotels, and there you were actually staying with the families and, and living with them and eating with them, and that was that was quite beautiful. And I wanted to ask you, Lily, too, how you got in, involved in the project. Um, I got involved later on. They had been shooting since 2008, and I came on board about a year and a half ago, um, and they were uh, at a point where they needed uh, more 
financing, they needed encouragement, they needed um, just a U.S. partner also. And uh, I was really inspired. I didn't know about the situation in the Western Sahara until I met with them. And it blew my mind that this was going on and I had no idea. And I think I felt a responsibility from that point on to uh, help the film and help the cause and make people aware of it. So. We just jumped right in. Right. And, and there's a lot of uh, women's groups working there. I guess that must have been... Yes, well, and actually the, the Swahari people are very pro-women, uh, which in the region is hard to find. And I think that that's something that we should keep in mind when we're supporting the Sahara cause, that we're supporting a people that really believe in our way of life, in a Western sense of equal rights for women. And actually it's a matriarchal society, very much so. So I think it needs to have us behind it and help encourage them because they're alone in that space, really. Mm -hmm. And w one thing I found interesting is I actually have seen work by you before, Javier, as, as, as a producer in documentaries. I know that you have a long activist history, and I just wanted you to talk to us a bit about that, to the, to the audience, about your previous work uh, with, with, uh, I, with yeah. social issues. I, I, I produced this documentary, this is my second, I produced a documentary called Invisibles, which was based on uh, five forgotten conflicts uh, pointed by Medicine Sans Frontier, Doctors Without Borders. Uh, and we work also uh, for a couple of years on that. I don't know, I feel like I, there's something that I'm really interested in, but it takes time. It takes time that sometimes I don't have. And it takes uh, a different involvement that you need to be there. Sometimes I was, sometimes I wasn't. Well, they were good on that, they forgive me. Uh, but uh, it's a different process than making a fictional movie where you just show up, say the lines, go back home. It's a different thing. And of course, there are unfortunately trillions of different causes out there that needs attention. Why this one? Well, it's not that you, you choose one over the others, it's that it happens to be this one because you were in the moment, in the place where this has to happen. And we made it happen. We made the documentary because we need to do it. Uh, uh, it's something that really puts fuel on me uh, because I guess I'm so much in the fiction world <laughs> that uh, it's good to be in the real world and, and, and face things that are are hard to take. Uh, and, uh, but you don't have to go far for that. I mean, now in Spain there are many of those. So, uh, unfortunately. The thing is, uh, as a producer, you want to bring, yes, some knowledge in the, in the form of a movie making. And that's all. It's not that you think of yourself saving the world at all, it's that you do what you can. And as you said before, it's a lot because they, they want to be seen, they need to be heard. And, and that's all you can do. And that's all we can do. And that's why we are here. And that's an achievement for all of us. Thank you. Okay, yes, I do notice there's some hands up, so we are going to move to some questions from the audience. Um, I will be begin with you. I saw yours first earlier. I just wonder if there's any um, developments in the situation since you left off. Um, so she's asking uh, if there have been any developments, well, what the developments are that have happened since December of last year when the documentary leaves off. Well, a lot of things have happened uh, since December in that uh, region of the world. Uh, things have become much more complicated for the for everybody involved, uh, Algeria, Morocco, uh, and the Saharawis. Uh, uh, from, from the political point of view, uh, there, have, there have been some minor signs of uh, both the U.S. and the European Union trying to uh, move towards helping the human rights situation uh, by sending uh, messages to Morocco uh, to try to uh, help them change uh, the situation, which is at the end very bad for them as well. And uh, in the region, the Sahrawi camps are now suffering from the lack of uh, aid coming essentially from Spain, which is uh, has been cut drastically because the uh, crisis is affecting um, everybody and it affects the amount of money that the private individuals send to the camps, which makes their life even harder. Uh, and the thing is moving slowly, we hope, uh, or we feel, in the right direction on the human rights uh, status, 
But uh, for example, uh, last week, the Kerry Kennedy went and visited the occupied uh, territories with her, uh, with the uh, Robert Kennedy Foundation for Human Rights, uh, which is a human rights uh, organization, and they published a report that just came out that is really devastating. I mean, essentially, the, the, the things that you see here are still happening on a daily basis. Uh, the Sahrawi people in the occupied territories are um, completely left alone. There's no way supervising them. And, uh, Things continue pretty much the same way, which is very sad. Even I just add to that that Amaritu, who is the woman who's so well spoken, her uh, children were beaten and in the last, I think it was about three months ago, sort of uh, assaulted in the region too. So it's very, it's very sad. Right? Yes. Sorry. Right. Yeah, it's, it's very complex. Also, a couple of uh, uh, activists, Spanish activists, and one Italian were kidnapped by Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda did a, like a commando operation into the camps and took these three people and had them uh, kidnapped for six or eight months. They were just uh, free. So it's very complicated because uh, the, the region is out of control. Essentially. We have a question. Yeah, there in the middle. Thank you very much for this really inspiring film. And I'm wondering if you know a bit about the Canadian position on this issue, and if you've come across any Canadian politicians or activists in New York. So they're asking if you know about the Canadian position uh, on this issue, and if you've come across any Canadian politicians in your work. I personally don't. Yeah. No. We should find out, right? I mean, we should, we should, you should all help us find out. So um, the question is about how sometimes fiction can bring uh, more awareness, the same amount of awareness than documentary. You know, we're talking about Hotel Rwanda. And if you've ever considered doing a fictional film about... I think it was one of the points that we thought about it before. Uh, but the flow, I mean, the, the common sense will take us to the real people. And try to make sense of, again, for us to understand what's going on there. Uh, some of our movies have been shot, no? Actually, in the refugee camps, there's a, a, a movie school, no? A tiny movie school, where these kids are learning how to make movies. And uh, one of them was shot, and it was in Berlin Film Festival last year. This year, sorry. So, and uh, at the same time, the documentary played. So, uh, yes, I, I agree with you. Fiction can be more powerful than documentaries, or equally powerful. But in this case, we, we thought for, for it, we thought about it for a second, and then we we, we gave up on that because we thought we we thought that now we can do. Yeah. But it's interesting how you also sort of show the process of everything, you know, of uh, what you went through. Like you feel the fatigue of all the hours of phone calls and trying to to get to the fourth committee. So I think that's also really valuable to. It's, just, it's kind of a movie. We yes. a movie. <laughs> Absolutely. So we have a question over here. I'll just take that. Yes. Uh, a two part question. One, as a person who came upon the situation over here, and you um, listen to these stories, uh, especially like the boy who was traumatized, his family was killed uh, in front of his eyes, and then he was taken to the How do you steal yourself? This is a person of the world. How do you steal yourself against just falling to pieces over that kind of. We'll start with that. It's, uh, the question is about, um, you, you obviously confronted a lot of difficult moments of people that had gone through a lot of it, you know, difficult times. How do you steal yourself? How do you stop from, uh, the question was breaking down in those moments? That particular moment that you referred to, where the kid is pulling his shirt apart, which is very heartbreaking, that was, what year was that? That's, that's a long time ago, what year was that? 18, 1918. But uh, of course we witnessed some other moments. Uh, how do you cope with that? I don't know, how do you cope with that? How do we all cope with that? We just turn a blind eye to it or we just listen and deal with it. And 
deal with the frustration that it comes with it. Uh, I think also this movie is sort of frustration. Uh, it's a sign of frustration. Like, what can I do knowing that you can do almost anything? At least a movie out of it. I mean, it's uh, you do what you can. You support the right people that are really doing the right things there, like the Kennedy Foundation, Human Rights Watch, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and some other many other organizations, Sahrawis all around the world, that are really focusing on helping the refugees and trying to uh, fight for the human rights uh, uh, in the occupied territories. And that's all you can do. Uh, remind to your governments especially in the States and France, who are creating the big battle, we are doing that in Spain, that they have to make some responsibilities and they have to really not support a, a, a government, a, a, a monarchy that is violating human rights, because all, again, is about economics. It's about phosphates, it's about fishing, and it's about that, but how come can we, can we allow to really turn the blind eye on human rights uh, in the name of money. We know that we do that. Um, we do that. We do that constantly, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, well, this is one of the examples that shows how we do it and what's the price of that. You know? and that's what we do. We do a movie about that. I mean, out of frustration. <laughs> If there was an outcome to the petition at the, um, the, the fourth committee at the, at the UN? I think those, that moment it was pretty strong. First of all, because when you get in a room, everybody's walking and not anybody's listening to each other. Listening to each other. Which is very discouraging. Like everybody's doing their own thing. People are talking out there and looking at the blackberries or doing like. Then when we talk, because I guess I am an actor, they all pay attention, which is weird and it's sad. I mean, what do I... It was the only I... silent moment. I mean, it really, they, they are on their phones, and it was literally the only silent moment was when Javier spoke. Yeah, so it's not very encouraging to see that in the United Nations. And, <laughs> and then you talk, and you feel like, okay, thank you, next. And you go, okay. It's not that you are expecting that you are changing the world, but some kind of, I don't know, I guess the, what happens off the camera with the ambassadors was more important for us to have a clue of what's going on, which is basically people that are uh, involved, countries that are uh, literally involved in this, are saying, it's not good, we're doing wrong, it should be fixed right now. The, the monitoring of the human rights aspect, at least. And in that sense, we have hope that it's going to go it's going to go fast. Not fa I don't know how fast, but it should go faster than we expect. The referendum side, that's way more complex. No? That's what I think. So, to answer your question, I think they are putting themselves on really trying to avoid uh, the human rights violation, which is a big deal, which is a lot. Um, a question here. Well, go ahead, and the gentleman in the blue shirt, yeah? With stories like this, do you feel that they need a Western celebrity figure in order to be brought into the Western public to have this? Yeah, I guess, I, yeah, yeah. That's why some of you will be here, I guess. Yeah, I guess, I guess that's why a lot of yeah. ideas in the audience. Which is okay. We're not doing anything wrong. <laughs> You're not doing anything wrong. I'm not doing anything wrong. We're not harming anybody here. Uh, was the use of that, or do we think that the use of it is something uh, negative, that's in everybody's opinion. That's, I mean, that's for everybody to think their own opinion. Me, personally, I think that beyond being a famous actor in some countries, because I'm in some other countries don't know who the hell I am, and that's good, <laughs> because then I can take some holidays. Uh, uh, to have that, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a crime because it's kind of creating uh, publicity about yourself. That's a funny thing to say. I, think I, I, I don't think I, I've done anything wrong in order to clean my publicity. You know, it's, I don't know. What I, what I mean is a lot of people criticize to 
people way more famous and powerful than I am, in, in the sense of uh, 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 reach to the audiences, for what they're doing, and I say, while you criticize them, what are you doing? Because even if they are doing it for the wrong purposes, which I doubt, they are doing something. And at the end of the day, we have to do things. I don't care what's the reason behind, as long as the reason is not a mean reason. Uh, so I never thought about it. I never thought it for a second. And in this one, let me tell you, I thought a little bit more because I'm in it. <laughs> and he knows. And I was like concerned about that. But then I understood that my journey is the journey of a person who tries to understand, which is basically the journey of all of us. So yes, in that sense, I say, okay, I will allow that. I'm the producer, so I, I should have cut that, cut that out of the movie. But I said, I understand why it's there, even knowing that it will be dangerous for me, because many people will think, are you portraying yourself as a hero? No, I'm not. I'm trying to to tell the story of a man who is trying to put something together to understand and they are not allowing him to do it because they don't want to talk about it because he's a hot potato, nobody wants to deal with it. And at the end we all go to the United Nations and say, do something please, that's all. And, uh, but to answer your question, uh, yes I guess, but I don't really think about it twice, it's like, well, whatever, I mean, you don't want to change people's opinion. Uh, if people think that's bad, then that will be bad. If people think that that's good, then it will be good. I have my own opinion, which is do what you believe, no matter what people believe. Or what you do. And, and I think that's the across I mean as a programmer seeing the film for a festival with the with my colleagues I mean what was very moving was the sincerity and like you're actually there it's like you're actually doing you know going going through the most doing I'm sorry going to the UN making all these phone calls making the trip living with the families well staying with the families it was quite beautiful to see so I think that's uh, I think that's quite important yeah okay question here So she's asking about the relationship because they showed the two uh, people in the this, in this Sahara, some living in the refugee camps, other living in the occupied territories, and just what the relationship is, like, is one preferable to the other? I mean, uh, both are quite tough. I mean, one, the refugees live in a um, state, pretty much a fake state of base, base of five uh, big refugee camps in the middle of the desert. They have no hope, they have no job. They live off uh, humanitarian aid and they're just sitting there for generations. That's quite frustrating, but these are not being uh, physically hurt. They just have no hope, uh, they study. They, some of them go away to study and they come back to sit down and watch the sun. And on the other side, you have the, the Sahrawi people in the occupied territories who have uh, a government that is essentially trying to eliminate the, their culture and eliminate their existence, bringing colonies, col colonies and, and even those who have tried to help uh, Moroccan authorities and have become uh, involved in, in, in trying to help uh, Morocco uh, take over and have taken jobs in administration, end up suffering anyway, because really what is happening there is, is an anti-Saharawi um, repression. So uh, those are really even more frustrated because they try to, okay, you, they see, okay, the situation is like this, no? Okay, I, I try to work for the government, I try to work with the government, but they see that they're, that they're not uh, fairly treated. They have no, the fact that they are Sahrawis, only the fact that they are Sahrawis will make them uh, second class citizens in their own land, which is terrible. And also they are open for physical abuse at any time, but uh, just for, you know, making a statement or, so I think both of them are quite uh, des desperate. And quite uh, sad. I don't know which one I would choose. Quick, yeah, go ahead. All right. Yes, 
I mean, for example, there is the Spanish, the Moroccan ambassador to Spain is a polisario uh, politician who changed the sides uh, 10 years ago or seven years ago. He went over, crossed the thing, and became uh, part of the Moroccan government. And now he's the ambassador to Spain. It's a quite an important job. No? But at the end of the day, they're be kind of betraying their own people. Okay, question way at the back and sure, absolutely, yeah. Way at the at the back, please go ahead. Oh, yes. <laughs> Right. So, how were the Sahrawis? How, how much um, involvement did they have in their own representation? And if they were comp compensated, if they were compensated. What do you mean representation? You mean uh, in the movie? In the movie, yes. I don't understand the question. Yeah. Sorry. Ah, no. 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 no, no. But uh, we won the uh, white camel, which was an actual white camel at the festival. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and they were not paid or compensated by any way or shape or form. I mean, they, they were just very <laughs> grateful to be portrayed, actually. And uh, Aminetu Haidar, which is this woman, this human rights activist, which is a very strong woman, she was very very also keen to this documentary to happen because she's fighting for this for so many years and she has gone through hell and so all of them they were very positive about it because they know what we think I mean it's about common sense and, 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 uh, and the thing happened naturally no? we didn't yeah but I mean the, the main point is there was no uh, nobody saw the cut nobody gave us opinions no politician ever said you can say this or, or not that, I mean this was completely us. Yes. Okay, and put the person waving their hand and I'll get closer to the front, sorry. Uh, first of all, thank you for doing this, and please don't stop, keep going. <laughs> I will try. Yes, go ahead. So when can the film be shown to a wider audience? So we are um, currently planning a screening in New York uh, at the IFC Center, which will launch a digital platform release as well. So on iTunes and various other digital platforms, the film will be available. Mid-October. Mid-October. Mid -October. I have time for, for is it one more question? Two, great, okay. The gentleman right here, go ahead. So the recent election of Francois Hollande in France, will that change the situation in any way? Uh, well, it could, it could be. Uh, there's a lot of speculation about this because uh, Hollande is a much more, uh, you know, uh, he's a socialist and therefore much more keen on, on solving this kind of situation. Uh, but so far he has not done anything. Uh, but the Sahrawis, some of the, the ones that I have spoken to were very happy that he won, uh, compared to Sarkozy who was really clearly Pro Moroccan, no matter what. So the last question. <laughs> right. So she's asking if they're planning on showing the film in Morocco, oh, in Morocco, or in the Moroccan occupied territories. Yeah. We'd love to, but uh, <laughs> that's not going to happen. <laughs> I, I. I don't think I would be a person on grat in Morocco, but I, I this, I'm this close. <laughs> we tried to really get in the occupied territory to shoot, but it was almost impossible. Uh, because when all these things happen, they really block any anybody from the exterior with the camera. They don't want the world to know it. So it will be almost impossible. Once one DVD gets over to the occupied territory, so it will be like a, in one minute it will be over. <laughs>
They'll probably change it. They'll redub it and say that they're the Moroccans are doing great, and actually the Saharis are abusing them. We did actually at the UN have a, a French. Uh, there was a translation in French that misrepresented uh, Javier's speech at the fourth committee, and in in the translation. So that's true. It's not it's not a joke. What, what true. people are willing the to do. Nations. Wow. Are you we we get it on time. No, I'm not blaming I'm just pointing it out. <laughs> no, it's actually the French the translation. The translation in the UN of Javier's speech was is put out in three languages. And the French language was completely different. Uh, it was completely different. So you are saying, so you are saying the French was... No, no, no. Uh, just a translation. Um, we do have to unfortunately leave, but thank you all of you for being with us. Thank you to you. Thank you. Hey, Cam! Cam! Woohoo!